that's the most common thing I hear is that an association, it happens in the exercise world, it happens in the gun world. This is the official Navy SEAL yeah. watch. This is the official fill in the blank. Yeah, that's the hook that they obviously intentionally try to get people with. I look back at my career, like I said, when I went through selection on the East Coast, we started with, it was a week of this. You either got hit in the head re repeatedly in the morning and then went into the kill house and shot. Or you went into the kill house first and shot and then got hit in the head repeatedly in the afternoon. So I had a headache for a week and it was like a ducked in stance that you had to use and you had to keep your hands in. The whole answer was just to fire hand everybody. And I just would pay so much money to get a chance to go back to that <laughs> and say, can we What's maybe? Uh, that was the description. You got to move them like your hands are on fire quickly. Put them out. Huh. Not heard of that before. Yeah. So this is this is like boxing. It didn't look anything like boxing. So are you wearing gloves? No. Okay. It was like boxing, except it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's I'm sh the and the thing. This was a long time ago, but the thing I remember is you know close the distance, rapidly, tempo. But at the same like. time, at the same time too, you, you still have to think about weapons retention. Yeah. You got to think about all of your gear on you. Um. It just in hindsight, it was uh, it was a that, and then they taught us some very basic prisoner handling stuff. That was the only hand to hand stuff that I was taught in seventeen years. Everybody, you know, the most common seal thing: can you kill somebody with your pinky? It's like, no, it's the index finger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Has to wrap, it gotten better? I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind yes. around this. It's like got this? yeah, fire hand, fire. Your and, hands are on fire, and you would like move. Literally, it was like a pigeon toed stance to protect a, a getting hitting the nuts and you would can Wing move Chun, maybe. forward and Wing backwards. Chun. Sounds like Wing Chun. Yeah. And I just, I just, I used it zero times mm -hmm. for real ever. Mm -hmm. One, because I can strike somebody with a weapon so much more effectively, specifically a rifle. Like, why would I drop that to do this? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Cause I look back at some of the drills. We did a drill called the hooded box drill. Have you guys ever heard this one? Mm -hmm. nope. Uh, they tape a square on the ground and they put a fabric bag over your head basically and then they'll set up scenarios and you're armed with simunition rounds or the at least the way I did it we had simunition rounds uh, I think it was both rifle and pistol and you sit there and they'll rip it off your head it's like on a string and you have to react to the situation in front of you and it could be an unarmed person walking at you and it's awesome because you see guys are like ha, ha, tsh, and you're like no <laughs> <laughs> no okay let's go through this again and then there's another one they pull it up and there's somebody standing right in front of your face but they're not being aggressive. And it's just all these different scenarios. And in the uh, the instructor said, once you go through it one time, you're forged, which is why they can't put you through it a second time because you'd be too dangerous. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Are these instructors military guys themselves? Paid contractors. They were not military guys. However, this particular training methodology got its hooks in somehow. Um, and it was around for a while. The stuff that's going on now is definitely more combative. I think it's just they call it a combatives program. I did not go through it, so I might be speaking slightly out of school, but from my understanding, it's much more based around there's a stand-up aspect, a grappling aspect to it, a striking aspect, and then um, the jujitsu is kind of the roots or the essence of a lot of the hands-on stuff. Our stuff, I mean, it was very simple. Like, you know, one, most of the time they're going to comply because they have a gun, and if, and if the interpreter tells them to lay down, and, you know, it's basically a lot of... It was driving knees and manipulating body parts and manners that if you didn't do it right, you would actually elicit a response that the person could end up getting hurt or killed. Mm -hmm. And they had no, and it was unfortunate because if you, I mean, you guys have probably all seen, if you drive your knee into the back of somebody's head, they're going to freak out mm -hmm. and they're going to fight harder and which is going to elicit, you know, then you're starting to play this chess game and escalating responses and yeah, <laughs> it was a shit show. <laughs> They did the best they could, and I, and I think it's gotten drastically better. But, yeah, that's that's the training methodology that I went through. So I've definitely seen that commando-based system. So how does a guy that does that teaches fire hands mm -hmm. get that as part of the official curriculum? What I, process? I don't Move know. Swing that a little bit closer, too. Uh, I don't like know. Up, up here because you're coming in and out. There you go. Right here? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Uh, it'll be the contracting – side of the military is interesting. You can you can sole source contractors. It's very difficult to do. Most of the time you have to put things out to bid. I was not directly involved with this person getting this contract, so I don't know for sure, but I know that there is sole source contracts or there are sole source, sole source contracts. 
and then there are open bid. It could have been an issue of price. It could have been an issue of previous training experience with other military units. It could have been an issue of he knew somebody on the inside, like a friend relationship, and his pile got put on the top. Mm -hmm. They could have sole sourced it. I don't know. But it's it once it goes into the contracting world, it can get it can get a little bit squirrely, so I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But it might have come down to a dollar and cents things as well. He might have gotten his if you can show a history of working with the government, from my understanding, you're much more likely to continue getting contracts. So towards the tail end of the year, military is October one to September thirtieth for fiscal year. Towards the tail end, you might be running out of money and you still need to get training and this individual and his organization will do it for X amount of price, but then they can show re repetitive history of doing it and the next thing you know, they're just in this self-turning cycle. They get a few disciples, is the word that I will use, on board inside of the community and then it could either be a great thing or a terrible cancer. Mm -hmm. hmm. Never used it once. Know of nobody who ever used it. It's possible, I suppose. So it would, is possible. Wouldn't all have worked well today all, all, at Everything is possible. <laughs> what would you tell a younger man who's looking in a martial arts magazine or a video and you hear something like Sistema, or some other ridiculous martial art being advertised as, you know, Russian Spetsnaz training, what would you tell them? In the modern day, I would just, I mean, I think my first question would be, how many times have you ever seen that used in a public forum and setting where winning it's all based on your performance, which leads to the victory. Basically, the UFC mm -hmm. litmus test. Mm -hmm. How many times have you ever seen that used, actually, for real, in an environment where you can't... Travis told me this one you know, a long time ago. He's like, don't watch the person demonstrating the technique. Watch the person who the technique is being demonstrated on. Mm -hmm. Well, in the UFC, I'm pretty sure that nobody wants to be demonstrated any technique of any kind. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is a much more likely... And, and take if they lead with Spetsnaz or Special Forces... Or Krav Maga. Israeli, that's, oh God, I lost my mind for a few weeks last year. on <laughs> Not necessarily Krav Maga, but just some of the, the shooting stuff I found online. To me, that's more of a warning sign, to be honest. Okay. Because just like there is no official SEAL watch, there's no official SEAL combatives system. Yeah. It's a merging of things that they think will work and that they apply towards the environment it's likely going to be used. The biggest warning for me is people when people say that stuff like this is, this is how the Rangers do it. I'm like, I don't, I don't know that they do, mm -hmm. but you might fool a lot of people if you say that. Mm -hmm. And to go from uh, military to civilian, um, so in the military, obviously, like your gun being the first option is not a bad thing because you're going to war. Well, it gives you distance. That's for right. sure. But generally, but what do you think about the people? Because this is a, a common thing that comes up. Um, with your average citizen. So now we're not talking about veterans. We're not talking about, you know, active duty. It's your average Joe yeah. who says, well, I have a gun. Like their response to everything is, well, I just shoot them. I mean, uh, you can have fun in prison for the rest of your life because I'm just going to shoot them is an answer that from a statistical perspective, the number of people who are going to encounter that in their lifetime is astronomically low. I think the number of people who would be peripheral to violence drastically exceeds the number of justifiable shooting situations. And the reality is, if you carry a gun and you don't know how to use it, you're a danger to yourself and everybody who is around you. Most people will go and they'll, you know, and I've seen this, they'll go and they'll buy a gun and they go to a range that's very linear and it has boxed, boxed out shooting lanes and it's right in front of you, the 25, 50 yards. And they'll go in there with the lights on and they'll shoot their gun and they'll say, I'm good, and now I'm going to carry it. And <laughs> I'll throw Rory under the bus because fuck that guy. <laughs> 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 Actually, I love Rory. We were talking up a death match today, and we just were laughing and cackling the whole time when we were rolling. But he was talking about his gun, and, and I always I love asking people about the tools that they use. I'm like, okay, cool, what kind of gun is it? And regardless of what kind of gun he was going to tell me, of course I was going to make fun of him. I'm like, oh, that's a good women's model. That's good. I'm not even exactly sure what he had. But then I actually started asking him some questions that are important. You know, do you have night sights on your weapon? And his answer was no. And I asked him if he was aware that half of every day is nighttime. And there are environments that you can go into that are low light. And how would you aim in a low light situation? Have you ever shot at a moving target? Have you ever tried to draw a gun 
from a seated position? Have you ever tried to draw in a seated position with a seatbelt on? Where do you carry? Why do you carry it like that? And all those questions, if you don't think about that, and your theory is, oh, I have a gun, most people also don't carry them loaded mm -hmm. because they think that they're going to just develop these amazing fine motor skills to be able to index, draw, load, acquire a target, and shoot while somebody's probably running at them. And by the time they get their hand on the gun, it's probably going to be too close. Mm -hmm. Because as Paul Sharp showed, a two-on-one with a pistol is pretty effective. Two-on-one with a rifle barrel is even more effective. Um, I mean, if you pull an unloaded gun on me, I'm going to kill you with it. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. I hope they do. Mm -hmm. But most people don't carry them loaded because they don't do enough training. They don't feel comfortable with it, but they feel like it's a safety device. And in my opinion, it actually introduces far more problems than it solves. And that's that's just assuming you're in a place where missing a shot wouldn't matter. You know, backdrop is hugely important. You look at the the guy who came into the movie theater uh, years ago. I forget. It was in Colorado. It was the Batman, I think. It was It was a Batman. And it came to mind because people were talking about that with the Joker movie coming out and how they thought it was going to inspire violence in people. And and I heard a lot of people, oh, man, if I was there, I would have shot him. Like, you probably would have shot him and also many other people that were directly behind him. Same thing in a restaurant or – uh, in a bar, which you shouldn't carry in. In most states, it's like if you have a sip of alcohol, you're done with guns, which it should be that way. But there's so many things to consider. And the last option should always be taking somebody's life. You need to get through... I mean, I carry all the time in Montana, and the likelihood of me ever pulling that gun out of a holster is almost zero. Because if I do, I'm going to use it. But I'll go through every tool that I have before that. Before you even show it. Yeah. I mean, if you pull a gun out and you don't intend to use it, you're a moron. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that, that act in and of itself brandishing is, I mean, illegal also for intimidation purposes. Mm -hmm. But if it comes out, I mean, again, and you don't know how to use it and it's not loaded and you have somebody who can recognize that and then closes the distance and they know how to handle that particular tool, you have a serious problem on your hands. But that's just me. Uh, another thing <laughs> I was talking, I was talking to these guys about on the way over here because they were talking about like, oh, what questions do you have for Andy or whatever. One thing that I've, I've, am interested in is uh, the crossover from uh, veterans to jujitsu. It yep. seems currently it seems to be like in vogue, let's say yep. uh, with Jocko and, and, and that, that niche market where you've got these kind of um, former military, what is it about jujitsu or is, is there anything about jujitsu that lends itself to appeal to, to, to veterans? I think there's a couple things there. First off, is it niche or niche? Niche. Is it always niche? Or can you say niche? I'm sure <laughs> in America you can say niche. <laughs> I think you can say niche in America, but in France you have to say niche. Usually what I'll do if I'm going to use that word, I try to use it twice in one sentence and I say it both ways. Just to make sure that I'm correct. Cover your bases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, I think there is a little bit of the flavor of the aspirational or inspirational, like a guy for Jocko, as a, uh, using him as an example. He's he's an influential person, for sure. And his background doesn't hurt with that. People yeah. pay attention to it because of that. They see the activities that he is involved with, and they want to be a part of it. So there, I think he would draw from both the veteran and the non-veteran crowd from that. Specifically for the veterans, at least the guys I know and the guys that I worked with, and even... It, outside of the special operations world, the military is a task-based organization. Here's your task. Go take care of it. And it's challenging, and it changes, and a lot of guys miss that getting out. I, I certainly did when I had to find my own tasks instead of having somebody present them to me. Uh, and, and then into the specifically the community I came from, it just they're, they're guys who appreciate hard work. They, they want to continue to constantly learn. They don't ever want to get to a place where they're saying, hey, I'm the smartest guy in the room. They see the value in getting humbled and getting their ass kicked and learning a new skill because they've seen it enough times because of the way that the career and the training cycle is. You learn something, but then you got to shelf that and you learn something else. And you suck and you have to build yourself up. And then you shelf that and you have to learn something else. And that's just a perpet perpetual cycle throughout your entire career. So I think it fills a lot of that physical, arduous void for them. And then, as you guys all know, it's mentally difficult in a variety of ways. You're going to have to control panic. You're get to play aggressive if you want to. You can play defensive if you want to. And I saw that those mentalities and all the the people that I ever served with as well. And I think it draws them it draws them into that. People will generally seek that difficulty. 
Yeah, I just uh, it, it it seems like, and maybe I'm just a, more aware of it now because of, like I said, mostly because of podcasts. Honestly, like mm. I just it, it 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 seems like maybe it's it's not as widespread as as it as it seems. But with like guys like Tim Kennedy and stuff, it just seems like there's this. Kind it's of I mean it's the armed services. Mm-hmm. It's a fighting culture at its core. Except for the Air Force. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. I love people who are in the Air Force. I have respect for everybody. But they get pajamas in boot camp. I'm just saying. I mean, I can't help that. I think they do. I actually don't know, but I'm going to say that no they do. <laughs> uh, no, it's you're, – you're rewarded for aggression often in any of those services. So if you come from an environment and you thrive in that environment – and then it's just taken away and you don't have that outlet, I think it's natural for them to seek a place, maybe not where they're getting rewarded, but they can just touch back into it. And I actually think aggression is incredibly important. I don't think it's something that should try to be suppressed. It should be controlled and contained, mm-hmm. but it shouldn't be, and it, there should be no attempt to remove it. It's a service, too. It's a public service, I think, for guys like Tim Kennedy and Jocko. It's been good for them to come out with their background. And you can say things about jujitsu. That I, there's a certain demographic that's going to pay attention to it. Probably, yeah. A- and it's good that more and more people get pushed away from the silly, like the Sistema and that kind of stuff. And the more people we can bring to jujitsu, the better. What was the heyday of those systems? I, I suspect that it was when information was probably more difficult to come by. and it was Magazines, maybe, yeah. Maybe magazines it was more 80s. Maybe. 80s to, 90s. like, yeah, to the turn of the century. When you could get away with saying... Oh, this is my well, secret. You couldn't just go right to Google and start the pulling thing, up I, YouTube I, videos. And I have yeah. two. Oh, so I have two <laughs> answers. One is when Black Belt Magazine and Inside Kung Fu Magazine basically had a monopoly on information, and people paid to get their bullshit article yeah. published. But we all, I think we all, for sure, myself, I, I really believed like, okay, UFC one, maybe not by UFC four or five i'm like the jig is up like they're all going out of business and they haven't Mm -mm. they're doing just as well Mm -hmm. so are they really oh yeah so you could but but so are religious cults Mm -hmm. you know people don't you think people kind of want to be lied to sometimes (laughs) i was just gonna say (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna say like they're a wit i almost feel like they're a witting participant sometimes and i don't want to which scares me i don't want to be too negative but you know not always not always. Sometimes there are people who are genuinely led astray. Correct. And then those are the ones that feel really grateful when they run into Travis's gym or another school. And yeah. Like, oh, yep. wow, Go a little closer. Yeah, with push it this just into you. No, not like this. Like bend it towards you. No, and, and the first, you the first like 1.5 generation of SBG and, and 1.5 generation of my guys in Korea come from martial arts that are less than functional, Mm -hmm. but who philosophically preach functionality. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not talking about the people who basically don't even want it because there are people who don't even want it. But the people who want it but are being lied to. Wanted it and then were led astray. They've been bait and switch. Yeah. yeah. They are, are, you know. That was a demographic. That was the SBG demographic in the beginning. Correct. And, and pulling and those people that had found out they yeah, and in Korea the too. Yeah, that was the whole bay. My well, first when disillusioned. I yeah. yeah. So SVG was all disillusioned uh, Jake Jeet Kune Do guys, and my first wave of black belts in Korea was disillusioned Hapkido guys. How long did it generally take them to have that realization? Like, how deep down the rabbit hole would they get? S- Personal, right? Some of them went far, though, right? I mean, it was a decade, including me. Mm-hmm. Well, part of the problem too is. That with JKD in particular, it's mixed. So they'll have functional aspects of it. Like they'll do some kickboxing. They'll even jujitsu. Paul Budak and, yeah. they, they, you know, he was one of the pioneers of introducing people to jujitsu. And then they'd click sticks together or do something complete like they would do like a fire hands yeah. type thing. And <clears throat> they never put two and two together partially because I think from the leadership down, they didn't know how to. And, um, but also there were sunk costs, and they felt too invested, and they didn't want to give it up. That, that yes. is a, that's a big piece. That's of a huge they wouldn't of let go. Yeah, and guys like Adam and Rory, th- they came from that background. Really? Oh, yeah. They neglected to talk to us about that. And me. A- and you. Damn yeah. it, Frankel. My coach, Chris Hodder, was a JKD guy. Yeah, 
But but was I. I wasn't a J Kitty guy because <laughs> I didn't. You, you were a crowd. I'm guy. late to the show for everything. No, <laughs> but what I mean, he was is, a fire hands guy. You were doing more important things. <laughs> no, but, but but I I don't think either of us is insulting those people. I think we're no. complimenting those yeah. people yeah. because they because they were willing. They to and go. I were honest. It's yeah. like oh, yeah. this is demonstrably better. I'm done. Yeah, how can you not have more respect for the person that makes that choice than right. the one who just says, well, I'm 10 grand into this, so I'm going to continue regardless yeah. of the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. When you sink that much money into something. And but, not just but, money, but, but the time. time. But, you yeah. know time. but you the know it's tougher? And, and the accolades, too. Okay, well that's the bigger part of it. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm a black belt now. You know, I'm a third-degree black belt in whatever. Well, Rokas. Yeah, Aikido wrote. instructor yeah. who took an MMA fight, wondering if Aikido would work. Found out it didn't. I was going to say, I think I can guess yeah. whether or not it did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and actually, Let it go. Andy was at Rokas's MMA fight. I in was there. Yeah. I didn't realize it was you, you sneaky son of a bitch. I had my yeah. camera. Andy was there ringside for that. Here's the deal, though. He came out hard. Yeah, but that was after a lot of training at SPG. I know, but I'm just saying I'm, I wanted to yell the gentleman, it's three rounds. Because <laughs> those guys came out at a pace that I know nothing he about fighting, but I was like, wow, that is not sustainable yeah. beyond a few minutes. And they did. They were like, whew, yeah. they calmed it right down. But, yeah, the pace you guys came out at was awesome, man. Your yeah. fight was phenomenal. I was staying up the whole time. Yeah, that was, that was, that was fight of the night. <laughs> that was Jed and him just knocked down. Oh, I got God. Him. But there's, there's Aikido guys that will argue with him who – don't know the reality of it. There's Aikido guys who argue with him that do know the reality of it, but don't want to admit it. Yeah. And then that's really unhealthy. That's the worst. Because then they wind up making all kinds of weird excuses and coming up with all kinds of justifications. And yeah. And, it, it, and to be able to just let go of that stuff and then move on to something else is so, it is something to be commended. Yeah. But sometimes the hook for that is, well, this, well we train for street. That's a sport. And then to the degree that they can draw in some kind of military association yeah. that helps them with that kind of con game, unfortunately. For sure, for sure. like Krav Maga is what it is because of the for adoption sure. for the military. Absolutely. Yeah. Israeli special forces. Right. Not just special forces, but Israeli specifically. Mm-hmm. That hook has gotten deep into a lot of communities and some of the, the our, our law enforcement in Montana, like the, they're honestly training their officers in Krav Maga, which I don't know much about, but I definitely enjoy it when you start well, it, going at them. My, <laughs> my problem with it is okay. Today's climate. Police officers are already under a microscope, oh, yeah. right? Like they do Body the right, cams. they do the right thing and they're persecuted for it. So now you got a you got a guy who's trained in Krav Maga, the Israeli special forces. That mm-hmm. in and of itself is not going to go well in court. But then you take an officer to court, and all the prosecuting attorney does is say, "Well, he was trained in Krav Maga," and they Google it, and the first three things that come up is like, you know, kicking people in the groins, breaking knees, gouging people's eyeballs out. Like, is that really? I mean, that, that's not really defensible. It's tough to justify that with the motto of protect and serve. Correct. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Correct. It's, you're going to have it's a little bit of a divergent. It, it goes both ways. So I'll let Matt tell the story of the Krav Maga guys who come to him. It's a great story. And it's his story. But on the flip side, more on Travis's story. Um, yeah. Okay, so you're not a special forces officer or a uh, soldier. And you're not in a place where you can sort of indiscriminately hurt people. And it doesn't make sense that, you know, a legal, legal perspective. But one of the, I won't say, I mean, one of the most, I don't know if it's intelligent, but one of the most compelling things, because I, I think like if Jock and I sat down and talked jujitsu, I think we'd have some disagreements. But that would be macro. The, I mean, that would be micro. The macro thing that I agreed with was one of the smartest things I ever thought he said because he was someone asked him a question about justifying jujitsu because there are all these other people competing for attention. And his point was like, whether you are, you know, in the military and like you're saying, well, you have other options. Yeah. Or you're a civilian, 
Travis and I talked about this. It's like, really, and oh, let's talk about civilians because here we are. Gouging the eyes, kicking the groin, whatever, knocking people's teeth out. It's like, if you're not, that already assumes that you're not connected. Like here I am across the table from Travis so I can hit him hard and I can kick him hard. But I can also leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only time I can't leave if he's physically restraining me. Right, he's not allowing me to leave, mm -hmm. and I think about my daughter. Right, and someone is not allowing her to do what she <coughs> wants to. Do. It's already jujitsu, not by choice, by definition. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's super important. Yeah, that is one of the best things Shaco said. Now that you brought that up, I'd forgotten that. Right, but I never heard him say that, but that's it spot on. It it's it's really good, and it's very a good way for like a civilian gym to sell it because even if my daughter were big and strong enough, and she's not like knock people's teeth in it's like she shouldn't be doing that but if yeah. someone is like not letting her do what she needs to do you're already connected mm -hmm. it's yep. jujitsu yeah. and what you said earlier about escalating force pain often makes things worse a you can't rely on it because the person could be on a controlled substance or who knows what and b it just escalates the situation with jujitsu you're controlling physically controlling another body not because you're going to be in pain but because you're controlling the body and it's a completely different yeah. level of control which should theoretically allow you to be able to control a situation without gouging someone's eye out or inflict less pain yeah exactly yeah. which well, is that's perfect yeah. for law enforcement yeah and that's i was just going to bring up paul sharp because yeah. i mean that's what's so great about you know having somebody <coughs> like paul who's got you know all these years of experience in the line of duty and it's about de-escalating mm -hmm. like that should be the first is not Let's make this worse. Yeah. Now let's back up. So. I yeah, that knee on the back of the head. I think what you were saying is they want to comply. Mm. It hurts so bad. <laughs> that they freak They're out. trying to adjust. Yeah. They, and oh, it's like you're yeah. resisting. It's like, no, I'm trying to <laughs> not break my neck. And, right. and then you put them in enough it just pain, goes up, yeah, right? Their yeah. reptilian brain is going to flip on at some point. If yeah. A, Survival, yeah. I can't talk to them because they don't speak English or I don't speak Pashtun or Arabic or whatever language or dialect we might be in. And yeah, if I... If they think I'm trying to kill them, they're probably going to freak out. Right. And I, and I can't, you know, I can't blame them for that. I'd do exactly the same and, thing. And the same goes for the police. I mean, so their job is to serve and protect. And, and what I always talk to, like, the law enforcement in, in our area is, look, I've got four teenagers. They're going to go to house parties. They're going to do what teenagers do. They're going to do what we all did as teenagers. I would like Hopefully to, not. Well... I sat around and just read the encyclopedia. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you were mostly in church like five <laughs> days out of seven. But for the average person like John and I, we weren't as extreme as Matt. But I would like to think that they have more tools than, hey, don't do that or shooting me, yeah. my kid. Right? And if they knew jujitsu, that would make me feel better. Because for one thing, just the confidence and the um, – self-assuredness that comes with knowing that you can handle yourself if it does become confrontational often avoids the confrontation because mm -hmm. you don't have to puff your chest up. You don't have to get nervous and be afraid. And then, you know, remember Chad. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in Vegas now, right? Yeah. yeah he's in Vegas now. Yeah. He still teaches, but he was one of my students. I think he was a purple belt. He's a black belt now, he's but black yeah. belt now, but back then he was a blue or purple belt and he was a very big, he was shorter than you. A little bit he on the heavy side. Had a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Family man. I still communicate officer. with him all the time. He's a great guy. But he wasn't a big athletic guy. But he was a blue or purple belt. And every time they'd have a situation in Portland PD where they were having trouble, there's some crazy guy who's <laughs> naked in the store, nobody can cuff him, they'd call Chad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably skip the naked ones. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you, these, these are big guys, big officers, you know. And, yeah. and uh, oh, let's pick up the phone and call Chad. And here comes this little guy that walks out there and handles the situation. It doesn't take that much. You're it doesn't belt. hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a couple ways you could look at it. One of them being a life-saving tool mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to focus on the lethality of a lot of things. It's like, well, to your point, adding things to the tool belt. Yeah, yeah just give them options. Like yeah. pa Paul always says, like, handshake to hand grenade. There's this huge gradient. Like, I think the analogy or the example, I should say, that he used is, okay, you're, you're coming home and somebody's carrying your big screen TV down the street. Do you get your gun and shoot them? Like, does that deserve 
Is that the death penalty? Like they is stole it an your LED TV? TV? <laughs> <laughs> is it one of the curved three D ones? I mean, let's well, get let's, specific here. Let's not get crazy. <laughs> but the point is, like, there are there are certainly things yeah. that deserve extreme punishment. It should be a threat to life, limb, or eyesight, though. But like, you need to have a, 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 a another tool for somebody's taking my stuff. Yeah. Now, taking your kids, taking your wife, like that's a different level. But okay, this guy's got something. He's walking down the sidewalk with my stuff. Can I get it back without killing him? If you know jujitsu, you can. And there's always the option of leave and execute your insurance policy, and the odds yeah. of anything getting sideways is zero. Right. Yeah. And and that's what like what Frankel said, and, and and he took it from Jocko. But the cool thing is, is as a civilian, you can get up and leave. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, you don't have to stay. Police officers don't have that. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think they should all do jujitsu. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Agreed. But, ba- and also back to sort of like battle versus war thing we've been talking about. If it's already physical, the battle versus war analogy works. It's like, okay, you know, what do I want to win versus what do I need to win? But when it's, when it's n- before it becomes physical and, and back to the, the original discussion, it's like I won the battle, which is I poked this guy's eyes out or I knocked his teeth in. It's like, but I lost my house and I'm spending 10 years in jail. That's the war. You know, it's like the whole Krav Maga thing and then Sistema, it's like if it worked, it doesn't. But if it did, it would still be non-ideal because you're like, I beat the shit out of this guy for insulting me in a bar and there goes my house and my car and my family and I'm in jail. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Even it, even in the fantasy world that it would work, it's ridiculous. Right. And that was my point originally with the court thing is like, it doesn't work. Right. But let's assume that it did, you know, for sake of argument, it would do nothing but get everybody in trouble. Yeah. Law enforcement, civilians, like it would be yeah. a disaster. Yeah. For law enforcement, it's like the city would be paying someone to, $10 million. Oh, the cascading effects. Right, yeah. Well, and beyond the monetary effect, the effect on the way that the populace views the police. Yeah, riots. Consistently. Riots in the street, yeah. yeah. And then on top of it, and, and, and this is always my litmus test, is like, okay. I'm going to so grab a water real quick. Yeah. So, because uh, I've had countless, and we should let Matt talk about some of his experiences where my brother and I were involved with like Wing Chun guys or Krav Maga guys or whatever. And, it doesn't work, but the best thing that I always say with when those guys come into the gym, I'm like, who was the last guy in the UFC that mentioned Krav Maga as one of his training methods? Has there ever been one? No. No, but but then you get into that feedback mm-hmm. loop of no eye jabs, no groin strikes, no bite. Oh, that's right, right, yeah. right, right. But I, I'm okay with that because usually what they say is, well, but you're not allowed to punch people in the throat. And I said, that's cool. You're not. But if you can hit me here... You can hit me here, right? I mean, this is harder to hit me here. Right. If you're capable of that, that's okay. Just go in there and knock everybody out. Yeah, that makes sense. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And the other thing, this now crosses over into women's self-defense, which is also can be a bit of a, a, a problem when you have people saying, like, rape defense, and they've got these scare tactics to get women to come into their gyms, and then they teach them to <coughs> kick people in the, in the groin. Everybody at this table has been defending their testicles since they were old enough to walk. Not always successfully. And the thing <laughs> is, but the thing is, is it's, it's not easy. Like you can't just easily attack somebody's groin. Like we've been protecting that for years. It also doesn't always work. Correct. I've yeah. been kicked hard in the nuts. And Me too. You know. Yeah. Pain, well, you can't and, rely and, on pain. And biting for sure. And I can say this with 100% uh authority i've been bit before mm-hmm. i've been bit before in real confrontation didn't work it worked to get him beat up more but it didn't win him the fight and guess what you don't bite when you're on top you bite out of desperation when you're on bottom yeah and that does nothing but to make the person on top more yeah, you just escalated because of the pain <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. You remind the person what they can do to you. Yeah. So it doesn't work. I'm going on record. 
Krav Maga does not work. And we know that some other martial arts don't work because Matt usually calls me or my brother and says, hey, uh, got these guys down at the gym that want to <laughs> that want to spar. Did you ever hear that story? No, but I would like to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I had a couple Wing Chun guys come in one time. Um, a, a smaller guy. Actually, was a, he came in by himself first. He was a smaller guy. And he was upset at some of the stuff he'd heard I said about Wing Chun and martial arts. And he wanted to fight. And I said, okay, we can fight. And he's like, well, I was a lot bigger than him. He's like, no, I mean, somebody more my own size. And I was running a competition team at the time. And there was 20 guys his size behind me <laughs> lining up with MMA gloves to fight him, right? Salivating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <God. laughs> and then he said, okay, no, no, not, not now. I'll come back. I'll come back. And I'm like, okay, you're welcome to come back. <clears throat> Never thought I'd see him again. And I got a call about a week later on my night off. I was at home that he had shown up with a big, huge dude. He brought they, his big guy. He brought his big guy. And they wanted to fight. I said, okay. So I get in the car. I got tape like I'm ready to tape my hands. <laughs> <laughs> the good old days. Yeah. This, this was almost 20 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Was, yeah. And yeah. I drive to the gym. And at the time, it took me probably 15 minutes to get to the gym. And by the time I got there, his brother had already beaten up the big guy. They were in a ring. We had a boxing ring. 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> so he was taking him down, punching him a couple times, slapping him, arm lock. And Rick was a blue belt? Uh, he's purple. Purple? Belt, yeah, probably. Purple. But, you know, but, no, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. Not a master. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And he was taking turns. He would fight the little guy, and then he would fight the big guy. <laughs> so you you guy. rest so I beat he your friend the big guy. I love Ricky. Yeah. yeah he's, he's the man. He's the man. <laughs> he is the man. And... Towards the end, the, then, the, then the smaller guy, the big guy had a great attitude. He was actually asking our schedule. Yeah. And the, and the smaller guy uh, was like, well, you know, he's, he's only taking me down because he doesn't want to stand up. And I was like, no, he's taking you down because he doesn't want to beat you up and he doesn't want to punch you in the face. So I said, okay, here, hang on, let's do this. Rick, don't take him down this time. Oh, no. And that lasted 15 <laughs> seconds. And the guy was like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> and so then he wanted to keep going. This wasn't Rick. Instigating it wasn't me; it was him. So yeah, it sounds people. self-driven for yeah, sure. Yeah, oh, for but sure. Denial, people. Denial is a mm-hmm. deep thing. Yeah. yeah. And he would try and crawl out of the ring, so Rick would get on top, and then he'd try and crawl out of the ring, and then they, we would restart, and then we'd try and knock Rick out. Rick would take him down, and he'd restart, and then he would swing as hard as he could to try and knock him out, which was making me mad. So finally, I just told Rick. Don't submit him anymore. Make him submit from punches. And then that, that was it. That was like he was done. <laughs> then he left. Make but, him submit from yeah, punches. But, yeah. but you know what else is so ironic? And it shows how much cognitive distance these people have. It's like, we are street lethal. But I crawled under the rope like pro wrestling, so you can't <laughs> hit me anymore. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, it is or it isn't. Like, I should, like, go down on the cement and then bounce your head off the yeah. fucking cement if it's your rules. Yeah. But he's like, no, my, I got my, it's like pro wrestling. Oh, I got my arm on the rope. Start over. Yeah. And let me try to knock you out. I mean, they're just crazy. They yeah. are crazy. I'll go back to Paul Sharp on that one. So obviously my daughter's big into judo now. And Paul's a black belt in judo as well. I didn't know that. Is he? No. Is that yes. where he started? What's that? Did he start with judo or? He's he did also judo? JKD guy. Yeah. The but first generation by and large. All of them pretty much. But you'll get this same mentality that, that, that we're talking about right now with like the traditional martial arts guys where uh, they'll be like, well, yeah, but there's a mat. It's soft. If it was in the street, it'd be hard. And Paul goes, whoa, 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 whoa. no, no, no. That mat's there for you, not yeah. for me. Because if we go outside and I throw you on your head, you're dead. Yeah, man, I'm sure you could go find a gravel parking lot if you want to, but that's not going to go well for anybody. No. Mm-hmm. No. And it's always just, it's just silly arguments like that that make no rational sense. Like, oh, but you guys train on mats. In the street, it's hard. It's like, uh, yeah, we train on mats because if we did this out there, there'd be consequences. And also, mats aren't that soft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> we were watching. So this is, Travis was telling the story the other night. It happened at Matt's gym early on, the, the Cameron Earl story. And uh, I didn't know that whole story until later, but I, I was in Northern California. Cameron Earl was, so Half Gracie was in Mountain View. Basically, no, no, no. I take it back. He was Palo Alto, right? No, no, no. He he's now is in Mountain of, View, but outside of no, Berkeley. He, well, now, but he was like yeah, Pleasant Hill area. Mm. But 
when there was nobody else in Northern California, people gravitated to him. So at, at a, a certain point, he had Dave Camarillo, BJ Penn, Camarillo, a lot of killers. Like anyone outside of LA, he had the, he had like the best guys. Mm -hmm. He didn't make them all. Like Dave Camarillo was already a gnarly judo guy. BJ had all this jujitsu from uh, Hawaii, but they went to him because he was the guy. And Hito and Gracie, who I really love, you know, they, they had a Gracie tournament, which is like IBJJF, no slamming, no nothing, no this, no heel hooks. And the Gracie tournament was uh, submission only, and you can slam. In other words, if he closes guard on me or triangles me, and I have the structure and the ability to pick him up off the mat, and he's dumb enough not to let go, I can slam him. Mm -hmm. And it was just, but but it's it's safe because well, it should be avoidable because you should let you, go. You just I, open your guard yeah. and play open guard. So, Cameron Old pulled close guard on Hero Gracie, who's like six four. Hero stood up. Had him like, wait, triangled him. No, no, Cameron trialed Hidon. Right, Hidon escaped from the triangle. Cameron then, when they went top to bottom, anyway, it it all worked out that Cameron was guard bottom. Hidon picked him up six four, so Cameron's about six feet in the air, and was hanging on and doing all this sports stuff. And they're on a nice mat. You know, it's a Gracie tournament. They have money, and they, you know, it's a, it's a nice mat. And he just. He, he, it's like, you know, when you snap a towel to get the wrinkles out of it, he just dropped him. And it was like, knockout. Just knocked out. I mean, he didn't spike him on his head and yeah. break his neck. He just, flat, like like flat, but the last thing to hit is your head. Yeah, the, whip. the end of that whip. And he don't got up and walked off and camera was just knocked out. You know, so it's like, that's on a mat. Mm -hmm. On yeah. the sidewalk, he's dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Brain damage at yeah. best case scenario. Right, yeah. I have a question for you. What do you got? So some of the reality-based self-defense, which I'll use as an acronym, there are some guys that do that that are good. But very often it's the bullshit stuff that we're talking about. And they'll make a big deal of what they call flinch response. Mm -hmm. And by contrast, I've talked to one of my black belts, Ray Price, who's a police officer and has been involved in police training, has told me uh, from his experience when – People are in high stress situations. You can't really predict, and it might be totally different in the case of the military because of the selection process. But when they first go through the academy, they can't predict if the person's going to run, if the person's going to charge, if the person's going to freeze. Yes. And Ray makes a point of not wanting to make <clears throat> um, fun of how the person reacts in the beginning because it, it, it's not uh, of choice. And then beyond that, the, the hope is to try and train them out of it. And again, it might be totally different because the selection process that you guys go through, by the time they get to that end point, they've already been weeded out probably. I've seen all three of those happen. You've seen all three of those? I've so seen all three of those happen, right. and I've seen people change their behavior. I've seen people who have run, turn, and charge. Mm -hmm. Not on the same... In the same... Not in the same moment. moment okay. But then I've also seen that person freeze. And I've had moments where... I froze. And a lot of it for me was I was I had too much shit I was trying to process. I was just totally failing in my decision making process. Mm -hmm. But I have seen I absolutely have seen people who are unwilling to move. I have seen people run. And I've seen people do some of the most like boldish, quite frankly, um nearly foolhardy charges at and it, it and it shifts. It's uh the way I describe it is everybody has got a cup. Like all of us has a, a cup when it comes to stress or whatever is going to trigger those responses and everybody's cup is unique and it all has a filter and if you've been through more training i think you can drain that cup faster so it's not going to overflow like overwhelming somebody who's never experienced aggression or violence of any kind ridiculously simple i mean in the jiu-jitsu world probably get them in mount bottom they're going to freak out but somebody 20 years into that's they're not going to freak out because they have tools, but I bet you there's probably still a way you could get them to freak out. It may just not be that. Mm -hmm. um, I think with more exposure, your response is always going to be better because you either develop a better filter at the bottom or somehow you increase the capacity of your cup. But I, I mean, I truly think having seen it and felt it in myself, I think there's a point for everybody where you're going to spill over. But the more tools that you have and the more experience that you have will help you avoid that point. Was there any way you could predict in advance how somebody was going to react? I mean, I think we really tried to in a lot of the training. So I administered a diving test. Mm 
And if you want to, I mean, water is such a great equalizer, especially if you put them under it with an apparatus that they're breathing through. But then I, as the instructor, get to control when they actually breathe, not their desire to do so. And you would see people, because they have a physiological response to the stress. And I would watch it, and it, I would sit there, and I'd be floating over the top of them. It's a one-to-one ratio with doctors all over the place, because people pass out underwater. And uh, you would watch them, and you just you start being able to recognize the signs. People, they would tense up. That would generally be the first one. And then the monkey paw would be the second one. They're trying to be calm, but their fingers are just getting totally gnarly. And then the last thing before they bolt is they'll plant their foot flat on the ground. Because they want to rock it to the surface, which is actually incredibly dangerous because they're on a breath hold, so the gases will expand. You'll get an air gas embolism, and shit's not going to go your way. You're going to get a chamber ride. It's just going to be a blast. And you learn to recognize those things, and we would teach them. Like, that's why you can't plant your foot. You have to follow procedure. And you would see them realizing and adopting, okay, regardless of how I feel, I need to follow procedure. And then the next time they were down there, you would introduce that much stress and they wouldn't have that physical response to it. So I'd, I'd ratchet it up a little bit more. But there was always a point where I could ratchet it beyond what the human being could take, especially when it came to controlling their breathing. And that, I think, was a good indicator, but it's not perfect. Because mm-hmm. some people couldn't tolerate it at all. If you took away their, their ability to breathe when they desired to do so, they would just freak out and come to the surface. That, I would say, would be a, a negative screening quality for sure. But again, I, I just don't think there's any perfect selection process or way to really forecast that. But there's some good things that you can do. So through exposure, you're getting them to realize what's happening sooner. Is that what you would say was happening? You're getting them maybe internally to recognize what's happening sooner. But the biggest thing that we're trying to get them to do is to focus on the procedure and what needs to be done and not on the end state. Just focus on the problem that's right in front of your face, and then you're going to get there eventually. You have to rely on the procedures. And, and I look back... I was having a conversation with somebody recently, and the, a lot of the, the entire job that I had, it was not complicated. I truly probably could train a monkey, and uh, Adam and Rory and I are actually going to do this <laughs> as a business. We pitched it last night. It's not a big deal. It's. Uh, I still think it's a bad idea. It's I'm an a- okay idea. It's monkeys and suicide vests. I mean, what could go wrong? I'm not John, invested. you left before they pitched this idea to me. I'm, you know... I'm going to probably go into like a 10% share. So. I thought the two Jews in a Gentile podcast was a better idea. That's true. That was We had three business ideas last night. <laughs> <laughs> None of them, by the way, were mine. Uh, but all were pitched to me. Uh, so it, it wasn't complex. And I look at everything. Everything that we did had a standard and had a procedure. Because when things get wild, if you don't have that procedure to fall back on, mm-hmm. it can get a little weird upstairs. And people will freeze or they could run or make the choice to charge ahead. But if you can ground everything in that procedure, it helped people navigate those things because they can focus on the procedure, not how they're feeling. Because eventually at some point you realize overseas, if you're scared of dying, it doesn't make you any safer. It actually could be more dangerous because you would do or not do things that could put you in more risk because you are afraid as opposed to just recognizing, yeah, like I'm terrified right now, but this is the job I need to do. And these are the steps that I need to do to successfully complete that. Focus on those steps, and it's your day or it's not your day. That procedure saved people, for sure. And they were taught. They were all taught procedures. Right. So it was just their ability in the moment to believe in it and do it or not believe in it and not do it. Correct. And recognize that even though they're panicked and even though they can't breathe when they want to, that if they follow their – they would – these students – would die in that water before they would deviate from seizure. They wouldn't necessarily successessfully get the knot out, but I had multiple students just go over because they would rather die trying to do it right. Which, okay, so it's Mount Bottom. Yep. It's Freak out or attack the face, obviously. No, it's Mount Bottom. (laughs) Uh, And people, what about when he's trying to punch you? What about when he's... And it's like, okay, I'm totally calm in Mount Bottom, and then you punch me, and I do this. Mm -hmm. And then I'm dead. I'm really dead. Versus what I said at the end of camp day, I'd rather go down with jujitsu than kind of fake my way out of it once yep. without jujitsu. And so you're saying it's like, fall as- pass out because we're going to get you up and there's doctors, yep. but pass out Attempting with what we taught you. Correct. Yeah, it's same. It's fo- yeah. Focusing yeah. on what you're doing, yeah. not how you're doing. Correct. And it's amazing. I mean, another question I get 
you know, from the SEAL community. Oh, do they make you hold your breath until you pass out? No, that's actually a failing criteria in every evolution except for one, which is the 50-meter underwater swim. Why that one becomes a passing criteria, I have no idea. But if people think that it's easy to go underwater where your entire body is screaming, just go eight feet up where you can see it, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to sit here and work on this knot until my world collapses in on me and pass out. That is not easy to do. It's probably one of the hardest things to do when air is right there. That's how much they are taught or we are taught as a community to believe in the procedure. And that completely applies to how do we get to the threshold of a door? What do we do once we pass the threshold of the door? You don't need to think about anything other than what the next steps that you are that you need to do. Because the worst thing that could happen is have a very procedural-based structured approach to clearing a structure, mm -hmm. which is all based off of angles and muzzle awareness and making sure that your gun's not pointed to me and then have somebody freak out, deviate from the procedure and run into the middle of the room or do something else. That would be catastrophic for everybody. So you just have to focus on that procedure. If you're following procedure and you pass out, yep, is that still a pass or is and that a pool comp it is a fail because there is a procedure to come to the surface too. If you can't make it, you put your thumb out to the side. You're requesting a free swimmer ascent. The instructor will come down. As long as you kiss the deck of the pool, you start exhaling and will bring you to the surface. So there is an escape mechanism as well. And you get four attempts at the test. So more often than not, you would see people go out on their fourth attempt because they just couldn't figure it out and they would rather die then put their thumb out because they know they're going to get either rolled or dropped from training. Gotcha. And that's the reason why it's not a pass is because you have an escape mechanism. The 50 meter underwater swim, you just <laughs> swim. Yeah. Most useless test ever administered to anybody for anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. On this mission, we have to go underwater for 50 meters. Why can't I just be on top of the water? Why can't I have a snorkel? Why can't I have a diving apparatus that gives me oxygen or air of some kind. Like, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that procedure. And I was talking, uh, the last time I was on Joe's podcast, I was talking to him about the biggest thing I think came from my military careers or the biggest tool that I took from that is just the ability to learn. And that requires you to get out of your own way, get out of, uh, get away from your own bias. And when Travis tells me to do something, I'm like, okay, I just do it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that, and he'll say, okay, now do this. I'm like, okay. Or John will say, hey, you should grab his arm with both hands. I'm like, uh, absolutely. I don't listen to anything that John said. <laughs> we talked about this in the lobby. He asked yeah. me, like, what, what do you want to ask him? And, and I said, I don't know about the specifics, but one, the, the thing that really interests me, because I, I teach for a living and I teach for a hobby, is like teaching and learning. Yeah. And learning now, but it's like, I don't, I think it would be, rare or difficult for someone to okay let me take it back it wouldn't be ideal it's not that rare or that difficult it wouldn't be ideal for someone to achieve a really high level in one field and not be able to translate that I, the reason i backed up because i think there are a lot of jujitsu competitors and maybe like people like tiger woods and whoever else who don't really have any intellectual idea of what they're doing they've just been kind of you know start, Mold, molded and crafted. started early have some athletic gifts and don't really have any awareness but for someone who started a little bit later and learned through fundamentals and processes and rather than just yeah their, their parents forcing them to do something i think it'd be hard or not ideal for that person not to be able to translate that I'll I'll go do things for a hobby, and my teachers will be like, "You're learning kind of quick. Well, what what's your secret?" And I'll be like, <laughs> "I'll be like doing what you say." <laughs> well, I'll be like, <laughs> I imagine my favorite student in my class, who says, "Not my worst. The worst students in terms of I don't like being around them, and they actually perform the worst are the ones who come to me on the first day of class and say, Professor, how do I get an A in your class?'" And I'm like, "You're doomed." <laughs> <laughs> you just assured that you will not and, by the way. and i won't i won't i'm not saying that i remember their name and yeah, I, i'm gonna yeah. like blacklist them i'm just like i know you're doomed because your yeah. attitude is wrong and the ones who are like what do i have to read tonight and then the next day they're like what's the homework for tomorrow and the next day is like how do i meaningfully meaningfully participate after three classes i'm like you're probably gonna get an a like we have 100 classes left but you're probably gonna get an a yeah because like you said, they're just like chunking it. They're not like, what's happening yep. six months from now? Um, 
but it, but, and so I just tell the, the guys who teach me, I'm like, I'm just kind of imitating the students that I like. And it's like, tell me what to do today and I will do that. And yep. then I'll come back and tell me what to do tomorrow and I'll do that. Yeah, I'll yeah. let you as the instructor yeah. tell me when I should deviate and I won't watch from the YouTube, last thing that and you I just told me how and to I do. Won't, and I won't be like, I'm going to study with you for two hours and then watch YouTube for 18 hours to find out why you're wrong. You know, and and not and be sleep deprived yeah. and wasting my time and money with you. Yep. Yeah. That was exactly what I was talking about. My yeah. takeaway for the seminars this year, right? People who are focused on what they're doing at the moment, yeah, and not how they're doing right. in terms of well, what am I going to get my blue belt? Oh, what am God. I going to get my oh, purple belt? Just focus on what you're doing yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. And you will. The rest will take care of itself. The There's easiest two way, totally different ways the easiest way I could get people to quit in buds was to get them to focus on how far they were from their goal. Yeah, I heard you talk about this. Right? So that, if you were to go, huge. yeah. So if you were to go to your students and be like, "Oh man, it's going to be nine years, eleven months, and three hundred and sixty-three days until you get your black belt," and then the next day it's going to be nine years, eleven <laughs> months, <laughs> and three hundred and sixty-two, and you're going to tap three hundred thousand times. Yeah, and you just <laughs> kept, and you just kept focusing on Remind this is it. how far away you are. You, that person is. They're gone yeah. before you get through that 300. Yeah. Whereas the other student who just goes, hey, I'm just here for today. And they don't, because they know that the step that they need to accomplish is today. And they don't give two shits about the 10 years. They'll probably get there in seven or whatever a reasonable Correct. number is. Yeah. Did you do that with everybody or did you pick out people that you wanted to do that with? I tried to make everyone quit. That was your job. That was my job. Yeah. I tried to, it wasn't my job to make people quit. It was my job to apply the curriculum which is designed to suppress a human being to their lowest point, apply stress, step back and watch what they do, mm -hmm. and then play a little bit with what's between the ears and see how do you approach problems. Are you a nonlinear thinker? Are you a nonlinear problem solver? Do you? How do you respond when you obviously know that you just won, but I told you you lost because it's I get to say that, and sometimes <laughs> life gets to say that. <laughs> that is awesome. People become unhinged, though. They're like, you know what I mean? Like, because they're so linear in their thought process. I finished first. I should win. I'm like, yeah, but you lost. Go out in the ocean. And they're just, ah. I'm like, and take a little note. We're going to be spending time together. And I just try to sow the seeds of doubt. For me, the biggest thing was make their world big. Get them to think about how far away they are from their goal, how long they're going to be cold, how long they're going to be tired. And the people who had the opposite thought process, who the only thing that they were thinking were, I'll stand here and tolerate you while you're in my face, and I'll get through this, and I'll deal with what comes next, they're bomb-proof. Yeah. You just... Yeah. And did you have people who'd be like, that's awesome. I don't mind losing. I'm getting in the water. Yes. And they're legit, right? They were, and yeah. I, I'm terrified of those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would win or lose and still go suffer the punishment. That, I'm yeah. just like, that was the podcast when uh, mm. you and Joe and uh, Dudley... <laughs> Uh, it was the elk hunt, I think. Yeah, uh, just a couple ago, yeah. yeah. I just listened to it, and uh, it, that resonated with me because you were thinking, you were just... Keep your world small was the you, thought you, process. You broke it down into days, like when you were in Buds. Like, you were like... I just want to see the when's sunrise. When's my next meal? And that so, was Hell Week. Yeah. Yeah, when's my next meal? Yep. And that's perfect. Like, it's... It, 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 that's such a great way to live your life, too, where it's just like... Just one day at a time. Yes. Just one day at a time. I'm just going to do, I'm going to get by today, get by today, and then eventually. And with that one day at a time, you have these massive goals. Yeah. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you just lay out the breadcrumbs, and instead of thinking about how many you have to step on, you're like, oh, here's the breadcrumb. And you just eat that, and the next thing you know, oh, here's the next one, and you eat that, and you eat that. Like my day-to-day -day buds was, I'm just going to see the sunrise tomorrow. But Matt's whiteboard, you and everyone who succeeded – didn't you say something like persistent about the goal or insistent upon the goal? Mm -hmm. Like your goal didn't waver ever, mm -hmm. but yeah. flexible about the tactics. Mm -hmm. so For it's sure, like six hours. Next meal. Well, you know how many? You yeah. Do you do you have any idea how many sacred tactics there are in the SEAL teams? No idea. No. Zero. Right. Because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Success is the only thing that matters. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to adapt to your battle space because what worked yesterday, it may not work tomorrow, mm -hmm. and you can easily kill yourself by saying, "Well, it worked yesterday." That's famous last words. My favorite question in the teams was why? Why do we do this? Mm -hmm. Why why do we do this tactic? And I always used to always used to ask the newer guys because there's a difference between understanding a tactic and understanding why you use a tactic and a history of where it came from. Like these are the things we saw. This is here's two options that you could use if you encounter this. That's why we do it. Mm -hmm. 
And if they can only say, well, this is the tactic that I have been taught, I'm like, okay, sit down. We need to talk. You need to have an understanding. That's Best a question for jujitsu as well. Super awesome. And, and I am always, I mean, selfishly, it's not only selfish because it translates to my students, but like somewhat selfishly, I'm always trying to improve my own game. But as far as being a better teacher or a better coach, it's like I was pretty early decent at teaching how. That's easy. And people may or may not remember it, and they may or may not benefit from it. But if you teach why, mm. they're going to remember it. And even if they don't do the technique you're showing, they're going to benefit from it. Yeah, rote memorization will get you only so far and generally deep into trouble in my experience. I have one question for you that I'm curious about myself but that I want to ask you before we go. And we don't have to put it on the video if you don't want now to. No, we're absolutely going to. <laughs> I want to hear it anyway. I want to hear it. <laughs> I'm curious, your experience as a veteran. Yep. How do we end, eventually, Afghanistan? Man, that's a tough one. I think it ties into a broader picture. I get asked this all the time. Actually, Rory was asking me last night. He's like, oh, hey, are we in a 100-year war? I'm like, let me just tell you right now, my GPA was 2.2 in high school. I have zero education beyond that. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. However, here's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer based off of what I have experienced firsthand and what I've seen and the people that I've engaged with. Afghanistan is just a geographical problem set. Um, everybody who's gone there and has left, the problems will return. So I, I don't know how we get out of Afghanistan because I think – more than anything, we're, we're battling against an ideology. And that really upsets a lot of people because they don't want to believe yeah. that their ideology, re regardless of how uh, pristine they think it may be, that there is just somebody somewhere who just violently disagrees with you. Mm -hmm. There's X and Y people, X, and there have been since the inception of people, and they're going to fight at some yeah. point. And they'll kill you for those ideas. They will kill you. And the, the beauty is almost nobody ever, ever encounters that person that will actually do that. Mm -hmm. Uh my old job was to go to that person's town, in that person's country, into that person's house, into that person's bedroom, and remove that person from the, chess, the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Thank God most people don't have to do that. But if you are around those people enough and you see the way that they behave and they have no care for quality of life or life in and of itself, I have watched them shoot more of their own people because if I'm between, if you're one of them and there's one of them behind you, they're definitely shooting through you. It's like, oh, that's a difference uh, in morals, perhaps, and how I consider and view life. And that exists outside of Afghanistan, whether that was the route or, you know, the rocket taken off. <sighs> the only way, in my opinion, that we can get, I mean, we would have to just leave, but still be prepared to fight in small units. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what the future of warfare is going to look like, smaller I don't, I don't think the days of ever squaring off with tanks is going to happen ever again. It's just going to be small, surgical and tactical, whether it's a combination of electronics and stuff from overhead, but it's still going to be some point in time where you have to have boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there is an actual clear, pristine solution for Afghanistan or the destruction of that ideology because in the attempt to destroy the ideology, you're going to radicalize other people as well because war is one of the most non-precise things I've ever seen which is why it should be a measure of last resort. What a positive way to end this. That's depressing. That was a great last question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not depressing. It's the reality of the world we live in. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, it does, I don't find it depressing. I mean, I, without... It's honest. Having been there, it, 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 it's like, yeah, as, yep. as I expected. Yeah. So what do you think about Eric Prince? His idea of having... I had him on the podcast. Did you? He... We were supposed to have three hours, mm -hmm. and we ended up with an hour. We philosophically disagree on many things. I don't think that you should outsource warfare. I think okay. if a country cannot fight the wars that they need to by manning their armed forces through appropriate channels, perhaps you should reconsider your foreign policy. And if it's important enough, you know, change the way that you source people. Mm -hmm. I think it's an honor to be able to wear a flag on your uniform, the flag of the country that you represent. You should not be able to buy that because as soon as you are beholden to the coins in the chest, it no longer has the same meaning. And one of the big issues overseas, it's almost impossible. Just like I could be in Baghdad and I could be around 500 people, they all look largely the same to me. But to the 
Sunni and the Shia, they can probably point people out and say, oh, this guy is not from our, you know what I mean? Like, there's all these little differences. And we look the exact same to them, whether it's armed forces or civilian contractors. So there's a huge ability for them to uh, muddle the waters of who is there doing what and what they stand for. But it's just America to them. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's it, because they're they're not discerning when it comes to, yeah. well, that guy has, you know, he has a polo shirt on and khakis and it, little, it doesn't matter. They're not looking at the, the nuances and difference between, and that's not like a normal uniform for a contract. It's just an example. Oftentimes they look very similar or impossible to distinguish unless you obviously come from that world. So it's tough. Will he, it's a guess on your part. Will he come back on or was he wriggling at the end and trying to escape from uh, the real questions? I don't, I don't think he would have an issue coming back on. I think he and I would be able to have a conversation where we don't agree because I did push back on him on a few things, you know, uh, and there were some more things I wanted to talk to him about in depth. I think that he is used to being asked a certain series of questions and answering without having somebody push back on those ideas. Uh, you know, he talks a little bit about, you know, the, the British Empire and how they used to do things, but there's a lot of things he leaves out, how, you know, they were basically taking complete control of the country, mining their resources and mineral. Like, there's a lot of stuff that you could go into deeper yeah. that levers the argument against using that type of behavior. Yeah, the analogy breaks down. It's like, are you saying America is a colonial power and we're going to go and colonize them? It's a totally different situation. Correct. So I think I think he would come back on. Okay. Uh, I look forward to it. Yeah, I do too. I mean, like I said, we... We could have talked for a couple more hours for sure. And at the end of the day, we could have agreed to disagree, which I'm totally, I, mean, I could care less. I mean, I believe people should believe what they want. And as long as it doesn't impact my life, like, okay, I'll stay out of yours. Other than the paid contractor part, though, it sounds str like his strategy for Afghanistan sounded very similar to what you talked about pulling out and just having small units there in case. I think it's the only up. thing that's sustainable. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, I don't, God, I can't imagine what it cost at the peak of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the. I had heard a number thrown around a billion dollars a day. I don't know if that's accurate. But you look at what it takes to have that many people there in the infrastructure and the number of people it takes to support that number of people, it just it starts compounding on itself. And it, I don't think it's sustainable over time. And like I said, if your enemy is not driving around in a tank, maybe there's a better, more efficient solution than taking a tank there. But that's just me. What the hell do I know? <laughs> <laughs> what else, gentlemen? You guys got anything else? Uh, please feel free to edit this, but since we're piling on Rory. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so you, you carry most, basically on a daily basis. Yep. How old are your children? 16, 14, and 11. Okay, when they were a bit younger, like six and four. Mm-hmm. Would you leave a gun on the countertop in front of them? Never. Yeah. I was at Rory's house. He did that. And he's like, oh, no, I told him. I'm like, you told your four-year-old. Well, it might work with that four-year-old or the six-year-old or the eight-year-old. But if or their house is anything like my house. Friends. My kids have friends. Mm -hmm. And that argument erodes the second okay. you have. So yeah. I don't think Rory, he's not that dumb. Well, 50% of gun owners do not own a safe. <laughs> Roy's not that we, dumb. We, we will edit that part out. <laughs> Roy's not that dumb, but what I mean is <laughs> just just the... That's psychotic. Because given the, the modern technology of a biometric safe, of which I have many in my house that I can put my finger on and it pops open in a half a second, the argument of, well, I have to have my gun on me at all times for an armed intruder, I love that one because I say, what belt do you use when you shower? Do you appendix carry in the shower? Or are you more like a four o'clock guy? What do you go with? And they're like, oh, I don't take it in the bathroom. I'm like, well, then what happens if you get attacked in the bathroom? <laughs> the shotgun in the corner doesn't help. The gun you have in every room, it doesn't help. Like it, And again, they think because they have a gun, gun in house equals safe house. No. Okay, but no, I don't, I'm not sure that's right. You're just talking about gun safety. That's, yeah. that's, I'm not, I would not advise that yeah. anybody ever do that. Yeah, it, it was weird to me. I stayed with him once after a seminar. He's like, oh, don't worry, I told him. And it's like, you have to consider the cognitive capacity of the person right, that you're telling. They don't right. understand that this motion could have yeah. consequences for somebody down the block. Mm -hmm. they, there's no way that a four year old understands that. Well, one of my other black belts is a huge gun proponent and Second Amendment proponent. But um, in talking to him a few months ago, he told me he didn't. He was in favor of licensing 
and did not think and was also in favor of the government making sure you had a safe. I Both think of it which should kind of yeah. surprise me, but yeah. Well, if you you have to, it starts with a question: what are what are guns designed to do? Mm-hmm. The true intellectual, honest answer is they're designed to kill. People will say, "Oh, they're for protection." I'm like, no, you can use them for protection, but they only work in one of two ways: the threat of them being used or their actual use. That's really all. I mean, when a cop pulls a gun and says, "Put your hands up," there's you're putting your hands up because you don't want to get shot. Or you can get shot. I mean, that's basically the way that it works. So if it's designed to have lethal effects, and if you look at it, I don't know of anything else in our society that has the ability to reach down to the end of the block and take another person's life. Mm -hmm. If it's designed for that, let's just treat it like that. I don't think it diminishes the right to have it at all. Let's just be honest about it. And if you can afford a gun, put it in a safe. So therefore, your neighbors who may be anti-Second Amendment are going to feel safer too. And they're going to leave you alone. Because you know what? A responsible gun owner doesn't generally irritate an anti-Second Amendment person. It's the irresponsible, look at my AK in Starbucks while I get my caramel macchiato, mm-hmm. that trips people out. I loved your last tactical asshole. It's my favorite page ever. I basically make fun of gun people, Matt, on the have internet. You seen, have, you, have you seen this Instagram? <laughs> Open carry guys? Oh, God. He had guys. three on him, but we could only see his back. I believe he was probably appendix carrying and yep. ankle holster, too. But yeah. the, the butt crack was the best. Yeah, he had a revolver down his ass crack. And both of his hands are full. I'm like, you're an idiot. If you're going to carry... <laughs> If you're going to carry, you might as well keep your dominant hand. Like, if you have a grocery bag, put it. Like, people don't think about that, though. They, <laughs> How fat was he? Super. Yeah. No, he was, he yes. was, he was fat. But I mean, he was rotund, for yeah. sure. Yeah. But, but I believe it was in Texas. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> And his shirt was awesome, too. His shirt on the back said, don't expect a warning shot. I'm like, you're a fucking moron. You need to have that on the front. <laughs> I'm like, for, let's just think about this from a logistical perspective. Nobody's going to walk behind you to read that and come back around in the front. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people get weirder on gun culture. That's the crowd that's going to buy into the Correct. secret combat military martial art training yeah. system. If you Google right now or YouTube Sistema <laughs> or Krav Maga, what you're going to see is a lot of fat people, a lot of people in weird, like, Russian camouflage. And then you're going to see 30 minutes. <coughs> Think of a 30-minute jujitsu class. It's 30 minutes of some fat Russian guy doing shit that won't work while other people don't train. Oh, they just watch? Yeah. And then they become deadly. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best of both worlds. If you're into that type of thing. I keep telling Travis I think we should drill more. <coughs> I think it should be 90 minutes a day. I don't disagree. <laughs> he keeps telling me class retention will be low. No, if, I, I no, mean, no, I no. still have to make a living. Yes, <laughs> no, so, At so. the end of the day, like... I mean, I I'm slightly joking, living. but I certainly enjoy the drills. That's where you figure out whether or not it works. Mm-hmm. Or why sh- it works, whether or not the way you apply it is working correctly. You, well, you're in and super longer good, drills are better. Yeah, and you're in super good company yeah. from Hickson on down through everyone who's influenced by Hickson. But, but, uh, it's the most it's the most productive part. It's the most rewarding part. It's the hardest part, you know. So, to not I think those overl- things are generally tied. Yeah. But you have b- essentially, by definition, um, higher tolerances than most people. So I don't think so. <laughs> what do you? Uh, I'm, I'm not. Pretty, yeah. I'm pretty sure just based on this, the test that you described. Yeah. Like I was, I'm petrified. I'm sitting over here thinking about the water. I hate You water. should not yeah. consider being a seal. Right. I, I don't. So, so what, I, so I, so <laughs> but for the record, I have never once thought about joining the military. Yeah. No, and I, and I don't mean, I don't mean globally. I don't mean there's not someone who has better musical ability than you. Yeah. I'm talking about like to sit there and be like, there's a lot of pressure here, but I know it's, going to benefit me in the long run, so I'm going to stay with it. People in this room, yes. Running a gym with hundreds of students, maybe not. And it's not... Still true. And pr- we, we, no, no I, we, and I say it jokingly. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah. And, and and by the way, but, but they all get enough. Yeah. Well, clearly, because my students are... like my, uh, Gus wins the BJJ yeah, yeah. Kumite if we had one this of, weekend. Of all the jujitsu schools. I thought we came up with another name. Yeah. That was we for MMA. More. Correct. Oh, yeah, yeah I believe probably. that. We should leave this on the podcast. So last night when we, we uh, left the restaurant, we uh, we went out and... Uh, First, it began with Rory basically saying, if we had a Kumite, I would obviously win. 
And I said, "That's pretty much how the conversation and I, and I, started." And I corrected him, and I said, "If it was an MMA kumite, Matt Inman would win." Yes. Well, he actually then corrected himself. He's like, "Well, I was only asking the question." And all of us said, absolutely not. That was 100% a statement. You said directly, <laughs> if there was a Kumite, I'm going to well, win. Two things. He's, he's a pathological liar. And he was probably completely stoned. <laughs> I had f- uh, fed him five gin and tonics, too. Oh, yeah. He's like, I'm not drinking another one. I would just slide it over. And he's just mashing up the wines. <laughs> but if there would have been a BJJ Kumite, Gus would have won. I agree. He's a savage. Gus is gnarly. So, and that's what I always tell people. It's like, well, Andy's gnarly too. Like, what, 18 months of training? 15. 15. So, clearly what we're doing is working. Oh, We're no, drilling yeah. enough. Yeah, sure. oh, no. Yeah. And I, and it's it, just he wants to drill 24-7. Right. And and you, I just like it. Of course. <laughs> and, and that's I'm wonderful. I'm not saying everybody has to like ice cream. I like ice cream. <laughs> it's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> but everybody but for, that but gets good in 15 months likes it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. For sure. Requirement. But if you have a little less time and a little less intensity and a little less tolerance, it's got to be different. What, yeah. what we're doing is a, a sweet spot. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a sweet yeah. spot. It's not watered down at all, but it's not well, making he people want to quit. He went to his first comp team last Sunday, so now he knows. He's like, "Oh, this is the class I'm supposed to go to." He's like, "Why are you guys counting? What are these dumb points? That's not what we're doing. <laughs> we're trying to kill each other." <laughs> you can do both. Uh, Travis are like, "What does that mean?" You can do both. <laughs> yeah, it's different though. I mean, things I, well, I don't know, maybe my mindset is uh, incorrect, but I, I just don't, I mean, I am I would sacrifice a position for points if I thought it was going to net me something greater in the end. I don't know if that's a good strategy, though. It's a good strategy to learn jujitsu. Yeah. Maybe not the best strategy to, to win. To compete in. To win your medal, depending yeah. on the rule system. Yeah. I think you're going to do just fine yeah. in your division. Yeah. But th- but I, w- I, w- I would say understand the rule set. Yeah. Abu Dhabi, IBJJ. Oh, you got to play in it for sure. But do not ever let it pollute or dilute your Mm jujitsu. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. That was kind of the point of my section today too. It's like, let's remember what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. That's a better end. And nothing, and nothing, (laughs) and dude, you went like judo wrestling, but you know, the, the nice thing about it is like, unless some could have been no gi. Could have been hoodie. I mean, can you? You're I never want to wear a hoodie again. By the way, Dude, that's one thing like, I've learned after oh, the yeah, last fifteen sure. months. Yeah. Like, oh, you're dead. Nice scarf. I'll kill you later. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. But but I mean, a hoodie. That's just a big oh, handful. Oh, 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 no, the best thing the best. to choke people with is a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Rat sharp shot. too. Oh yeah. I What's almost think a zip-up hoodie thing? would be yes, better. I just, just make sure you get a little bit of friction on the way by, just to just to twist the knife a bit. All good. I think yeah. a zip up hoodie is the worst. Just those teeth would feel so bad. That's the worst. Yeah. But we all know jujitsu doesn't actually work in the street. Carl Towns will rest in peace, put me to sleep in a hoodie. He did. He's the only the, I've gone to sleep twice in jujitsu. Once was on the mat doing jujitsu for real. No gi. And my first black belt put me in a Peruvian necktie, which I had taught him like a week before, so I saw it coming a mile away. And I thought, this is a neck crank. Like, and I, I'll tap. I mean, I'm not proud. But I'm like, this is not a choke. And it's not an injurious neck crank. And then he was waking me up. Did you ask him if you won? That's so Because f- <laughs> it, it didn't hurt. <laughs> it, it, it shouldn't hurt. It should kill you, right? It didn't hurt. And I was in my mind thinking very logically, processes. And I'm like, okay, he's doing this thing. I showed it to him. I know what he's doing. But it's really not choking me yet. And I was like... And I, s- <laughs> I still feel a little bit bad about that, but the thing was, <laughs> and then I, Carl was not on the mat; it was in his living room, living and room. I tapped. But I was watching it, and first of all, <laughs> I couldn't quite believe it. Which point were you watching? The uh, Peruvian necktie? I was no. watching Carl. Carl oh, okay. choked me in a hoodie, and <laughs> so I was watching room. TV in a room about this size, and John had his back turned, facing a wall on a computer, returning an email or something. Yeah. And I watched Carl kind of walk in behind him and get behind, get the choke, and then choke him and then pull him down on the chair and it's i thought he's gonna let you go <laughs> I, um, I tapped yeah and i was just kind of in shock and then all of a sudden you're in convulsions <laughs> on the ground I'm like, why did you do that <laughs> there was no reason to choke him and and the funny part was he hadn't seen you since then until he ran into you in athens remember 
It was Montana yeah. camp. Or Montana camp. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And Montana. he was a little bit nervous if you were going to still be mad at him. And then years later. <laughs> <And> Shocker. <laughs> I wonder why. But, but I, you know what? It's funny you mentioned that because I thought about the letting go theme. Yeah. And I only had an hour and 15 minutes, so I couldn't, it was, wasn't time for a bunch of anecdotes. But, you know, I thought about Carl because um, it wasn't until maybe hours before the camp or weeks or days or minutes mm -hmm. that I made my decision, right? I was like, fuck Carl Towns. I'm going to fuck him up. <laughs> <laughs> And then, but but the beautiful thing about jujitsu, and 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 Carl's a beautiful human being, and we're all we're all friends and brothers. And I just got there, and I'm like, no, like I'm just gonna have a good roll with him, because because why would I let something that he did under the influence of two bottles of Estonian vodka a decade ago influence my philosophy of jujitsu today, which is just be cool and roll with Carl. Yeah, well, I hope this doesn't change. Um, your view on that, but he was sober when he choked you that that time. <laughs> it was the same trip, but a day earlier. Yeah, it wasn't that night. Yeah. That the night he attacked <laughs> you on the bed, you were hiding. That was totally different. So, <laughs> so in that case, but it's just, it doesn't influence because what it was then is maybe I had only joined SBG probably six months before. Yeah. Matt brought me to Ireland and England, and Carl was probably jealous because yeah. that happens too. Yeah, you know, sure. and, and but for but whatever the was vodka or jealousy or whatever, that was a temporary state of Carl, which had nothing to do with me. And, and like, how can I say <laughs> for 10 years, this is my jujitsu, this is my philosophy, this is what I believe. Yeah. And then like preach that to all my students and then be like, I'm a fuck him up. Man. <laughs> it's just, I was like, no, you know, it's just, Carl's a cool dude. And, I'm going to lead by example and just roll with him. You know? mm -hmm. Salome mentioned him today in her class. I'm not sure how yeah. many people were listening so, to him. I mean, and, and, and. I was and going to, but then I, I thought. No, but, it, and but you know what? She asked me this morning if she should mention him. I was like, yeah. If you yeah. feel like it's something you should talk it's about, go ahead. And it's cool, but, you know, it's like mentioning JKD, too. Not quite that old, but there'll be, like, really, really good purple belts who are like, who? Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. What is that? I've never done anything that stupid. I don't know who that is. You know, so it's also a generational thing. Yeah, but you can see his jujitsu reflected in Matt, and it's and like I said, and his teaching. Yeah, and it's it's that um that structure mm -hmm. and the humor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people would get it this time because this time, what was it like, two years ago, we were here last. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the last time most people saw Carl. Mm -hmm. It was more than that, wasn't it? Was it two years ago? It was two years ago. And then you and I went to Manchester, and that was the last time. So. But we should have ended on my positive note. Now we get for well, that's a positive note. Yeah. It's a no, positive no. note to see, you know, Matt here and teaching and. Dude, and Glenn, so like Matt's here. Yeah. He's awesome. Glenn Powditch, mm -hmm. as I think in terms of, uh, you know, Matt's a pro fighter, but in in terms of um, coaching and, mm -hmm. and Thinking about analytical jujitsu, jiu jiu Glenn is at the top of the food chain. And Coltrane. Coltrane's legit. I mean, uh, there's Casey. A, yeah, there's a legacy. Casey Jones. His uh, black belts are awesome. From yeah. pro fighters to pro teachers yeah. to everything. He had, he had yeah. a good culture. Yeah, he had a great culture. Leader. Yeah, yeah, and and the black belts that he has in the UK are the best guys. Yeah, you'd never want to meet. So that's positive. Yeah.